de un centro dedicado a la teledetección de distintos campos medioambientales especializado en la observación de la nieve y entonces hizo su tesis entre este centro y el Centro de Estudios de la Nieve, un centro especializado en la modelización de la nieve. Y bueno, pues en ese periodo tuve el, el placer de poder trabajar un poquito con él en, en mi etapa postdoctoral fuera, en el extranjero. Y realmente creo que la aportación que está haciendo en el centro César, pues bueno, es muy interesante y hoy nos va a describir sus, sus trabajos de, de observación de la nieve con una técnica muy novedosa que está abriendo pues, un espectro muy interesante de cara a observar nuevos, nuevos procesos. Eh, bien, César, te, te dejo con, con la palabra y bueno, yo estaré encantado de discutir un poquito lo que nos presentes. No. Uh, well, yes. Ahora, ok. Yep, I'll just share my screen. So, thanks for the introduction. First of all, sorry for not speaking Spanish in uh, this presentation. And uh, I hope to be able to do the next one in, uh, in Spanish, but this one will be in English. Um, so, I'm going to present the work of uh, my PhD and some uh, I did a bit before. So, the title is a bit misleading because here I only mention uh, mountain snowpack, uh, from how we can monitor it from space and uh, how we use high resolution satellite photogrammetry to do it. But uh, actually, I'll introduce a bit more, I'll focus a bit more on the method, the high resolution satellite photogrammetry and how it's applied in many fields. And then I'll focus a bit more on uh, what it can do for snowpack uh, studies. Uh, just to complete what uh, Jesus said and to present myself. Um, so I indeed just did my PhD and finished it last winter uh, between Toulouse and uh, Grenoble. And before that, uh, I moved a bit during my studies and I did my bachelor in Paris. Uh, studying geosciences, and uh, then the master between, uh, so which I spent most of time in uh, Norway, and uh, so I took my master between the University of Oslo and Toulouse, and now I'm here in Zaragoza for one year at least, and uh, hopefully a bit more. So today uh, I'll introduce uh, the, uh, as I said, I will talk about the how we can map. Uh, topography and elevation changes of uh, the Earth's surface with satellite photogrammetry. So first I will present the method. Uh, then I will show some application in Earth sciences. And uh, finally, I will focus and uh, I, will, uh, I will talk more about uh, what we can do with this method uh, to study snowpack, seasonal snowpack in mountains. So first about the method, uh, we use satellite images. Uh, which are a bit specific, so it's optical images, but uh, along the same orbit, the satellite every 30 or 40 seconds will acquire two or three different images of the same area, uh, which means that the, the surface didn't change in itself, but just the change of uh, view of uh, viewing uh, direction of the satellite will uh, introduce some deformation of the image. And then, uh, as your eye and brain might be able to see the the, the volume, the relief already, then we are able to calculate the topography from uh, these uh, triplets or pair of images. So there are different satellites which can do that. The one I use most is called Pleiad. And uh, you have, uh, it's, uh, it acquires data and images only on demand. So you have to request an image and then they plan the acquisition and then they, they, they acquire. Uh, it can acquire mono, pair, or triplets or images, and uh, even video, uh, in fact. And the typical footprint of an image is 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers. And it provides two types of images, the panchromatic, which means black and white, and that's the highest resolution, and it's half a meter for each pixel, or multispectral images with a red, green, uh, blue, and near-infrared band. Uh, and this one has a lower resolution of two meters. So with these panchromatic images, you can calculate the topography, so the elevation, or what I would call all through the presentation, a digital elevation model, a DM. And uh, these DM have a typical uh, resolution of two or three meters. And so that's a first step to calculate uh, one topography, one DM, and that's already, already interesting for many studies. 
uh, if you just need the elevation. But if you repeat the acquisitions uh, through time at different on different days, different seasons, different years, uh, you'll get a time series of uh, topography, and then you can start to map uh, changes of uh, the elevation. In a bit more details, uh, the workflow we use. So if you focus on the, can you see? Yeah, uh, you can see my mouse, I guess, on the screen. If I point at things. So if you focus on the right part of uh, the of the of this image of this uh, slide, uh, so we start from the images and the fact that they are they don't have the same uh, orientation point of view means that we are identifying uh, each pixel in both images of a pair. So here the red one, which is uh, shining and easy to spot. And then since we know the direction uh, looking of the satellite, we can trace ray, which when they intersect means that the point position at the surface of the earth. And then uh, it's done for all the, all the pixels of the images and you get uh, for each pixel of the image, the information about its X, Y position and elevation. So first we obtain a point cloud that then we rasterize into a DEM, so a proper image, a proper image with each pixel giving the elevation uh, at this position. Uh, we repeat this operation here. We, for example, we get two DEMs. Uh, then we have to ensure that they are well located at the same place. So we usually have to move one to fit perfectly the other. Then you take the difference and where you have stable terrain, so let's say road or bare rocks or things that didn't change between the two acquisitions, you should have an elevation change of zero. And everything else that changed during uh, between the two acquisitions could be mapped and uh, will appear as an elevation change in this map. Um, so that's a, that's a workflow I used uh, in several different occasions. And that's the base of many of many different work, what you can do with uh, LIDAR or uh, drone photogrammetry or any difference of topography. So that's uh, rather simple. Uh, why it's uh, getting more interest is because there is more and more <clears throat> satellite with this capability of uh, acquiring stereo images, so pair or triplets. Here it's a small timeline of, uh, of the history of these satellites. And uh, what's striking is that uh, on the far left, it all started with the American militaries who were so scared of the nuclear capacity of, uh, of the Soviets uh, that they built some satellites to monitor what was happening uh, in the Soviet Union. So back in the 60s, they went so fast and they built so powerful satellites that they already had uh, images with a resolution at least as good as half a meter. So that's in the mid 60s. And uh, so most of these images now are declassified, so they are uh, they are used in some studies to 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 check at how looked the glacier back in time. Uh, so they have uh, they had a high resolution, but bad quality in some other ways. So like the the there were many deformations which were which were disturbing these images. And then in the civilian uh, activities, it started in the 80s. Uh, and uh, then the resolution of the images and the imaging capability and the quality of the image increased. And now uh, in the 2000, since 2010, roughly, or the mid 2000s, we have many, many satellites which can do that. And there's more and more to come. So now it's already out of date. But uh, so there are there are different companies which are launching a fleet of satellites, so like dozens of them, and uh, so most of, of yeah most of them are at least for all the high uh, resolution they are private owned uh, satellites, uh, but uh, you have still some uh, access possibilities which I will develop uh, later. And so the the satellites I I use are the one with the stars here, Pleiades which are mixed civilian and military French satellites. And they are at the close to the highest resolution achievable nowadays. <clears throat> so now what can we do with this uh, method in earth sciences in general? Uh, I will just illustrate with two examples of uh, in which I contributed, in which uh, with which I worked, but there are many more and many different. Uh, one of the main application was uh, in the of uh, of satellite photogrammetry uh, was with uh, glacier studies so this time taking the difference between two dams and using it to change the, the glacier thickness change which means uh, that uh, you get the volume change and then assuming the density of uh, the mass loss organ you can even guess 
the, the mass change of the glacier, which is key for sea level rise studies, for example. So here we use this method to uh, study a glacier in Svalbard. And uh, what you usually or what you easily get uh, to study glaciers is uh, auto also simple uh, images. And then you can already map, for example, the front of the glacier, the extent of the glacier. And then you can see here that from the dark yellow to the green and then uh, beige and then blue uh, line, it's slowly uh, retreceding uh, up, uh, up slope. And um, so it, it's losing uh, area. But uh, so that's one information, but you don't know uh, about the volume or about the mass change of the glacier. So using the DEMs and the satellite photogrammetry, we were able to, to map the elevation, elevation change of the glacier. So that's the result between 2009 and 2014, so only five years, uh, between uh, Pleiad DEM in 2014 and uh, our aerial campaign by the Norwegians in 2009. So, and we, we exported some of the dams at four meters resolution and took the difference. So here you can see that uh, in uh, purple, the, the most loss occurred close to the tongue of the glacier. So at the bottom part here, and that the higher part is still in negative uh, balance. So still losing height, uh, but uh, it's of course less intense uh, high up in the glacier. So then we were able to calculate that the, this glacier over these five years is losing height or even mass uh, at uh, minus 0 0.7 meters uh, seven meters per water equivalent per year. And that's about twice as much as what it was losing uh, between 1960 and 2009. And then we're also able to compare with model output and see that uh, it was it was this uh, change in the uh, in, uh, in mass loss was mostly due to uh, the climatic imbalance at the surface of the glacier. So th that's a method which was used in many different uh, glaciers like that. And as well, uh, using uh, other satellites, it was used to map the mass change of all glaciers on Earth uh, between 2000 and 2019 using another satellite, which is called Aster. Uh, which is uh, another team which did that. But so just to say that it's usable on very specific glacier, the one you're focusing on and you want to study very carefully, but it has been generalized. It has been generalized as well to all the glacier of the world. Another field uh, in which it can be used is, uh, so that's a, an example of something which happened very recently. It was one year, almost uh, exactly one year ago. Yeah. And uh, a disaster uh, happened in India in a valley uh, quite high in the in the Himalaya. And within a few minutes, there was a, there was a massive flood and a debris flow, which so it's hard to imagine the the violence of the of the event, but it was really rap It was really fast uh, and, and and destructive. So here it was a hydropower plant which was completely destroyed, completely destroyed. And uh, there was here around 200 workers on this power plant which died in the event. And so all that we knew at that moment was the the, the this incident and that it was fast and it looked like a flood like a fast flood in the mountain coming from higher up in the mountain. And the question was, OK, where did this water came from? When did this water come from? Uh, is it a, a lake uh, held by a moraine which was uh, suddenly released? Or was it, was it a, a water pocket in a glacier which was suddenly released? Or what was it? And there were many different uh, theories, and nobody could know. And quickly, some people started to look at satellite images uh, around the area. So the power plant that we were looking at is here. If you look at the bottom left of the screen, it's the Tapovan HPP. And so further up in the valley, they noticed that uh, there was a piece of mountain which was missing on uh, some uh, images, and it was matching perfectly or perfectly with uh, it, it, it. It looked like it appeared. It uh, it happened during the just before the the event. So it started to look like this piece of mountain uh, just came off and there was no sign at all of uh, of lake uh, rupture or uh, or glacier uh, outburst so uh, actually it, we, they were able to uh, to to qualify this as a rock and ice avalanche and uh, using the the same the satellite photogrammetry method, we could calculate uh, the volume of uh, this landslide. So on the left image, it's this small area here. 
So that's a typical worst case uh, scenario for our method because it's in the shade. So there is little contrast in the image. It's in a very steep area. So it's more prone to errors. And it's a very, yeah, the, with almost no, uh, yeah, the, very little contrast. So it was a quite hard case to study, but we still, the signal was so strong that we still managed to, to, to capture the change of volume due to this uh, rock and ice avalanche. So the map on the left is the difference between uh, several satellite uh, DEMs. So Pleiad, but also Worldview, which is the American equivalent. And uh, so the, we were able to, sorry, to measure the, the volume of uh, this uh, landslide and knowing the thickness of the glacier, we could actually uh, determine that it was uh, around 80% of rock which fell off the mountain and only 20% of uh, glacier ice. So, and the, the, the event is quite unreal because this fell off by two kilometers from the, where it was to the bottom of the valley in just a snap, like less than a minute. So the shock was so violent that all the ice of the glacier or most of it went liquid. And that was the main source of water for what became the flood uh, further down the valley. So they were uh, in, this, in this study uh, led by a, Canadian colleague, there were a lot of modelization as, as well to modelize this flood and uh, see where did the big, uh, the rock spots uh, deposited and where the water continued and how it, it mostly match, uh, we, we managed to reproduce the, the sequence of the event all along the volley. Um, and uh, so here it was, uh, it was, it, it's, a, it's an important contribution to be able to measure the initial volume to just that's the input mass that you have at the entrance of your of your phenomena and then you can try to track it and uh, it helps to calculate as well the energy that was released at the at the during the shock and so on so we found the 26.9 10 power 6 uh, cubic meters which i have troubles to represent so i roughly calculated that's about five times the volume of the basilica del pilar which is much more informative, I guess. And uh, so that's quite an extreme um, rock and ice avalanche, or we could uh, simplify it as a landslide, but it was as well, this method was as well used for more classical landslide when you have a piece of mountain, which will be smaller, but which is like a going downhill uh, in, a, in a more classical landslide uh, type. And so that's, uh, that's it for the, general applications in earth sciences. One that I didn't mention, but maybe that you've heard of recently is the, for volcanology. Uh, you, they are now able to follow the, the eruptions uh, with a repeated acquisition of satellite images. And I think they are, I know they are doing it for the La Palma uh, eruption in the Canaries. Uh, they did it in Iceland as well. So the same, they are the, before the eruption and after, they, you're mapping the surface and then you are able to calculate the volume of the lava which was emitted and then you can calculate the flux and infer a lot of things about the volcano. Uh, so that's one more application, but uh, yeah, that's the three main uh, uh, field of application of this method, uh, glaciology and uh, geohazard like landslides and uh, volcanology. Uh, all of these occurred the past, uh, I mean, these applications were started in the past 15 years, I would say. And, and recently in 2016, they started to think, okay, now we have quite high resolution and high precision uh, DMs. Could we uh, see some smaller signal as well, such as uh, seasonal snow in mountains? And um, so, uh, the 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 aspect of snow we will uh, that will interest uh, us here is that uh, it's a it's a water tank uh, which is accumulating in winter and then while it's melting in spring and summer it's uh, releasing liquid water and then it's a source of water for all the population uh, downhill for hydropower for irrigation and for the ecosystems. But uh, to study this, you need to know how much water you have in your mountain. And that's quite hard to measure because it's highly variable in space. So from one point to another, just a few hundred of meters away, you will have uh, quite different uh, snow packs and snow mass. And uh, it's hard to maintain the uh, automatic weather station in the harsh conditions of mountains. And it's hard to just travel through these mountains in, in, uh, in winter. So you can, it's not easy to map by hand. So it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to know how much uh, snow you have and how much water you have stored uh, in snow. 
So the idea uh, in the PhD, which was led uh, by Simon Gascoigne in Toulouse, so my my uh, PhD advisor, but a previous PhD, uh, they tried to apply satellite photogrammetry to measure snow snow depth. So this time taking the difference between a, a winter digital elevation and a summer digital elevation model. So following this previous PhD, I started mine with uh, two main objectives and two main questions, uh, which will be to try to quantify. So the, the, the first PhD first showed that it was possible to, to map snow depth. And, uh, but there were still many questions left about uh, what is the error of a typical satellite photogrammetry snow depth map. And that's very important because it's good to have a measurement, but it's even better to have an error associated to it. And once we have qualified this error, can we use the snow depth maps, uh, for instance, to improve snowpack modeling? So that's the two main questions I will try to answer. And we applied this method. So first, it was it was used in the Basias. And I'm back. You can hear me, yeah. Yeah, perfectly. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, so yeah, qualifying the error and uh, no, yeah, sorry. I was uh, that. So the first in the the first trial they did, they use uh, images of the Bassias catchment in the French Pyrenees, and since that, we used it in several different places, all the red points on the map. And here today, I will present so some more uh, case study of the Bassias catchment and one uh, case study in the Tulum catchment, which is in California in the U.S. So first, to qualify the error of our snow depth maps, uh, we went, uh, we acquired data in the Tulum catchment uh, in the US, because there uh, the NASA is running uh, uh, since 2013 a very ambitious uh, mapping plan uh, plan of the of the snowpack in the mountains, and from the snow accumulation peak in the around the first of April through the melt season every two weeks, they are flying uh, airborne lidar all over this area that you see on the right, the delimited by the blue line, and actually over even more uh, more basins, but that's just one of them. And every two weeks, they acquire uh, snow depth maps with this uh, airborne lidar campaign, and they run some models, and then they are able to quantify uh, the snow mass, the snow water equivalent in the basin. So that's immensely important for them, because then there is San Francisco, uh, the city just a bit further to the west, and there is the agricultural plain uh, just between San Francisco and these mountains, and they, they are experiencing ma massive droughts uh, these years and in general. So they are really, really interested in knowing how much water there is in their, in their snowpack. So we ordered some Pleiad images, and by chance, which is because uh, you you cannot order the image uh, close. Uh, I mean, you cannot choose on which day exactly the image will be acquired. You can choose like a roughly one month, and then they they try to acquire it uh, when there is no clouds. And by chance, we got Pleiad images just one day before uh, an airborne uh, an airborne lidar flight. So which means that the we can assume that the snowpack didn't change too much between the the two acquisition. So we considered the airborne lidar as a reference because it has a, an error of around. 10 centimeters per, per pixel on the, on the snow depth measurements, which is at least one order of magnitude, around one order of magnitude better than the, the Pleiad method. And here is the, the main output of it. So on the left, you have the snow depth maps uh, from Pleiad. Uh, over over this area in the middle, you have the snow depth maps from the NASA from uh, with the airborne lidar, so the reference. And on the right, you have a surface occupation map. So that's a, another product we calculate with the images. Using the multispectral image, we classify them with a random forest algorithm. So first we teach them, OK, this is forest, this is snow, this is lake, and this is, uh, this is stable terrain. And then the, the random forest is doing the job for all the pixels of uh, the image. And uh, that's quite useful then to, to split the analysis between the different areas. So that's the right uh, part of this figure. And at first sight, we're quite happy with uh, how our map uh, looks or how, uh, how our play at snow depth map looks like. And uh, if we zoom in, in the bottom part of the figure, we can distinguish some different features which are typical of, um, of uh, mountain snowpack. So you have a corniche, and uh, you can see that the, 
uh, this part was eroded, eroded by wind, and then some snow was deposited uh, on the on the lee side of uh, this small hill, and you have it as well in the airborne leader map. Or you can have some avalanche deposits, which were running down some uh, small um, small uh, valley, and uh, the, which deposited at the bottom of uh, this hill. So that's quite uh, encouraging. Another way to look at it is to draw profiles to see how much variability we can capture. So here we look at the Pleiad snow depth maps wrapped on the topography. So you can see that there is more accumulation. Uh, yeah, the more blue it is, the thicker the snowpack. Uh, so you can see that there is more accumulation on this plateau and less at the volley, all good. And along the profile, uh, both methods, so Pleiad and ASO, the NASA one, the, are comparing quite well, uh, even though there is more noise on the Pleiad measurements. So that's expected as well, but mostly it's following the same pattern. So we're quite happy with that. Another way to look at it, which is often used by hydrologists, is to look at the snow depth uh, according to the elevation. So that's the left plot. So the red boxes are the Pleiad measurements. And the green blue one is the NASA one, the reference. And we can see that we managed to we match the the the, the NASA measurements uh, quite well at all elevations and for different range of uh, snowpack thickness. So the chance here is that it's uh, every for every bin for every elevation yeah, the snow depth is averaged. I mean we are looking at the complete distribution, so it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's reducing a bit the error. But then we are we are still quite happy with these results. And on the right it's the same, but it's the total distribution of all the pixels with snow. And uh, again, we're quite happy with uh, how we match. And if we look at the mean snow depth, uh, we have a difference of uh, nine centimeters uh, between the Pleiad and the ASO. So that means almost no bias, no average bias across the map. Uh, that we are honest with that. That's a bit of luck because uh, we have different cases or other cases where we know where we had a larger bias and we know that it can happen. So here it's a 10 centimeter bias, but we know it can happen 20 or 30 centimeters uh, would be realistic. And uh, the chance as well of this validation data set is that uh, we have we can calculate the the difference of uh, the snow depth maps. So that's what you are looking at uh, on the left. And then you can see how your so we, we see that as an error map for the Pleiad measurement. And then you can see how your error is specialized. So we did different studies and changing the resolution of this error and calculating semi-variograms to try to qualify especially this error. But uh, here you can distinguish some typical pattern with uh, undulation with like a, a negative uh, error here, positive here, and alternating like this. And uh, that's a typical error of, sat of this kind of satellite images, which have some uh, some error in the position calculation and which, rendered, which renders like this uh, in the final product. Uh, but uh, all in all, uh, the, we, we, we calculated the error for the snow depth measurement at a pixel. And here we obtain uh, so a kind of a random error of uh, 0.69 uh, meters. And uh, so yeah, a bias of uh, 8, 9 centimeters. So we were that's, that was quite useful for us to have this kind of details on the description of the, of the error of uh, our snow depth map. A quick comparison, which might be interesting, because so here, what uh, Jesus and Nacho are using, uh, they are doing the same kind of uh, of uh, analysis with uh, snow depth maps, and they use uh, either photogrammetry, but then with images acquired by drone, or terrestrial laser scan, and uh, it's uh, so it's all the the family of the of the ways to map uh, snow depth in mountains, and they each have their uh, their plus and uh, their their positive and negative sides. So here with satellite photogrammetry, we have a larger error. So here 70 centimeters, but it's typically between half a meter and a meter. So in an, in a snow depth measurement, while the error would be much lower with a terrestrial laser scan or drone uh, under 10 centimeters. Uh, we have a special resolution with satellite photogrammetry, which is a bit coarser, which is coarser than uh, what's it, what is achievable with their methods. Uh, but on the plus side for satellite photogrammetry, you can uh, cover much larger areas, so typically 250 square kilometers. And you don't have to carry anything, which I've heard, because uh, I've heard that the terrestrial laser scan or the drone is quite heavy on uh, Jesus' uh, back. And we can study any point on Earth, uh, given there is no cloud and good weather and some sunlight. 
so that's a, a good site. And uh, there is a free access to uh, the Pleiad images for European researchers. I'll, I'll mention that uh, a bit again at the end. Um, so yeah, but then definitely it's all a matter of what you want to study and what uh, what precision you need, what process you want to study, or if you're more interested in a large area, or if you want to focus uh, on a small one but have a higher resolution and higher low uncertainty, uh, then you should choose one method or the other, but they are quite complementary in the end. So then we we used this method and we uh, we applied it uh, still in the Bassier catchment, so back in the French Pyrenees where where it all started. So they did the first study with only the 2015 uh, map. And then every year, uh, Simon Gascoin was uh, asking to acquire images. So we have now a nice time series running until uh, until last winter. But when I did my PhD, I had uh, all these maps. Uh, so you can see as well some limitations of the of the method, all the purple area or areas which were saturated in the image. So then we were not able to calculate any snow depth in these areas. And the green part is forest. And the same, we are blind in forest areas, so we won't measure snow depth uh, in there. But for all the, the area above, uh, then we, we still get uh, quite some information and quite some uh, some signals. And um, so we used uh, this uh, this time series of snow depth maps. Uh, first, it can be used for uh, for just drawing the hydrological profile kind of of uh, of the snowpack in there, and just to know its distribution against elevation, and then seeing it's changing from one year to another, or even within one season. Because in 2018 we had two uh, acquisition in the same winter, one in February and one in May. So it's uh, it's quite nice to see evolving the snowpack, and you can qualify the variability. And uh, so uh, you have the snow depth, you have the snow covered area, uh, thanks to the classification. And then multiplying both, you just get your snow volume. And uh, you can see that the snow volume eventually is variable between years at every elevation. Uh, but uh, actually, it's uh, it's for different reasons at different uh, elevations. So. Uh, at low elevation, the, the snow cover area is very variable and the snow depth. While at high elevation, it's only the snow depth which can vary because the areas are always, uh, these high areas are always saturated uh, in snow. But uh, then we used as well this time series and uh, assimilated it to combine it with a, a model because the, the the weakness of that is that of the the snow depth the play at snow depth maps is that you get one point uh, one measurement uh, at a time only one day in your season and um, and then you don't know what happened next so uh, then it's nice to combine it with model uh, which have the capacity of uh, calculating the the snow depth and the snowpack uh, at uh, every every time step whatever you want but uh, uh, it's really hard to model accurately the snowpack because it's hard to uh, basically know the precipitation, know the weather conditions in mountains, and especially to know it uh, in a specialized way, so pixel by pixel. So here we, we use the method to combine uh, our snow depth observation with a specialized model. We used Crocus from Meteo France, which is a detailed snowpack model, so modeling a lot of physical processes which can happen to the snowpack. Uh, through compaction, uh, evolution of the snow grain grain size, uh, and different radiation and all that, and so we had the, this uh, this uh, this uh, simulation grid on the left. So we don't scaled a bit the our snow depth maps to uh, 250 meters, and then at each point of the at each point of the grid, uh, when we have a Pleiad observation. Uh, so sorry, what I forgot to mention is that it's ensemble simulations. So for each point, we have 120 simulations of the snowpack. And when we have the play at the observation, we stop the modelization. Uh, we observe what the distribution of the of the 120 simulations is. So that's the gray points on the left. We compare it to the play at observation, and then we eliminate and duplicate uh, some of uh, what we call these particles uh, to be closer to the observation. So it's done through a particle filter, which was developed by Bertrand Cluzet, another PhD student at the CN in Grenoble. And so we apply this at each point independently, and it's changing the, 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 the model ensemble. So that's the green distribution on the right here. And if you look at it in a more temporal way, uh, that's the upper uh, graph on, upper on the right. Uh, at the assimilation date, so when we have a Pleiad observation, that's the, that's the red square. 
uh, we have the distribution of the model in gray uh, before our simulation and after you assimilate it it's shifting and getting closer to the observation and then this difference is uh, kept through the rest of the season so mostly the, the melt period so we did that for the five different years we had the data for and to try to uh, validate see if we improved or uh, uh, or deteriorated uh, the simulations. We used the snow meltout date, uh, so which is the day when the snow uh, disappears from a, from a pixel. And we compare it with Sentinel-2 uh, snow meltout date, which is then an independent uh, measurement of the snow meltout day. And as well, in 2018, we have uh, these other Pleiad measurements later in the season, which is then as well independent from the assimilation data. So I'll just show a few results of that to give an idea of uh, how how it works. Uh, so here is the snow depth maps. Uh, so the, the scale is reversed uh, from before. So now the, the more it's white, the deeper the snowpack. And uh, so you can see on the left the, <clears throat> the snowpack modeled by Crocus without assimilation. And uh, so with some more snow on the top of the of the mountain here and less in the volley, all good. Then the Pleiad observation and in the middle, and then on the right, it's the Crocus simulation after assimilation. So after we, we change the distribution of uh, the particles with the particle filter. So we see that at the date of assimilation, the, the, the modeled snowpack looks closer to the Pleiad observation that's uh, expected and that's what we want. So everything is good. Now, if we look at it uh, in a different way, that's for all the dates. So one line is one date of acquisition, so one winter. And then the left column is the difference between uh, snow depth maps of Crocus and Pleiad. So that's the, the, yeah, the difference between the model and the observation. And then on the right is the difference between the model after assimilation and the observation. So basically, on the right uh, column, you see that uh, we get closer to zero meters difference, which means that the assimilation brought the model closer to the observation. That's the basic of assimilation, so everything is good. And uh, the more interesting is for the year 2018, when we had these two acquisitions, so only the February one was uh, assimilated. So that's this one. And you see that, again, the assimilation is bringing the model closer to the OBS, all good. But then 19, uh, 90 uh, days later, we have this other Pleiad observation. And then we are able to see that uh, on the right part, so when we assimilated the, the, the February map, we still have, uh, sorry, the modeled uh, snow depth is closer to the observation. Uh, so 90 days later after the, after the assimilation. So, it, so it, it means that we indeed improved the snow depth modeling and that the benefits uh, were still lasting 90 days uh, later, uh, 90 days after the assimilation. So that's a first independent measurement. And then another one. So as I said, looking at the snow meltout day, so on the top, uh, we so we only had Sentinel-2 data for three years, so we can only do this for the for three uh, winters. And here it's the impact of the assimilation on the snow meltout day, uh, meaning that in that in blue we improved the the prediction, the simulation of the snow meltout day, and in red we deteriorate, we degrade the simulation of the snow uh, meltout day. So here I'm just showing the result from one experience for which it works uh, especially well. So here in almost all the points where we where we assimilated the, the snow depth, we improved uh, the snow meltout dates. So through, uh, through correction, uh, basically, of the snow depth, adding more mass to the snowpack because uh, the because the precipitation uh, were underestimated. So the assimilation was able to compensate for that. And at the bottom, it's the same map, but uh, looking at the histogram, the distribution of it. And then we see that uh, also on the right side, the positive, it means we improved the, the simulation of the snow meltout date. And on the left, we degrade. And then we are mostly on the right side. And we improve by around 10 or 20 days uh, in median, the simulation of the snow meltout day. And um, another uh, results from that uh, is to look at the snow melt. So basically, 
basically the, the liquid flux out of the snowpack and how it's changing with or without sim, uh, assimilation. So here the downside is that we don't have any uh, reference measurements. We don't have uh, measurements for that. So it's only comparing the two runs of the model uh, with and without assimilation. But it still gives us a hint of uh, what uh, the assimilation can change for very hydrological uh, applications of this. And so the gray line is the cumulative uh, snow melt. And uh, the gray line is without assimilation. And the dashed green one is with assimilation. And so the same in this case, you see that we added more snow uh, at the assimilation date. And then further in the season, it means that uh, you, you will have uh, more snow melt and that it will last a bit longer as well uh, in the in the late season. So it's uh, quite promising because that's uh, one challenge to go from uh, estimating the snow mass in mountains and then what's interesting eventually is that knowing how much water we get in our rivers. And so here we can see the impact of uh, correcting the snow depth just once in the winter and uh, how it can change then all your melt season uh, through spring and summer and uh, all the implication it has for hydropower, uh, agriculture, and all of that. <clears throat> so that's it for uh, all these works. There just a few, so I hope I convinced you that the first snow depth mapping from a satellite photogrammetry works. I know some were skeptical, so I, I did my best to try to convince you. And then uh, it has Back, sorry. Um, yeah, just a few words for the time I'll be here. I'd be happy if I can help with anything in the lab. And the thing I can help with the most are so satellite images processing and using uh, like a bash tools like JDAL or QGIS or some other toolbox. So if I can, you think I can help with anything like that, uh, don't hesitate to ask me. Okay. And as well, maybe more interesting, uh, I was mentioning that uh, as a European researcher, we can have access for free to uh, stereo images. So either Pleiad, the one I was showing uh, through this presentation, or Spot 6, 7, which are a bit lower resolution, but still useful for many things. And uh, so you can access these images for free. There's already a large archive of uh, images uh, covering many parts of the world. So you can explore this archive. And if you find the image which suits your purpose, you can uh, ask for them. Or you can as well plan a future acquisition if you have field work in April in this area and you need the accurate uh, digital elevation model, you can, uh, you can ask for it. And um, so I, I, if you're interested in that, I can help because I'm not sure <laughs> it's uh, available for all European researchers, but I'm not sure how much it's translated in English. So I might just do some basic translation to you and show you some templates of what you have to say. So you need some, of course, some uh, scientific uh, purpose, but it's quite simple, uh, easy to request images, and then they tell you if they can do it or not. But if you're interested, don't hesitate to ask me some more about that. And this time, that's it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. OK, Cesar, thank you very much for your presentation. Now we we'll leave some time of, of questions if, if any people is interested to, to ask. Hi, Cesar. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this super interesting presentation. Uh, I have really enjoyed what you have presented. Uh, and I have one small question about the geolocation of the images. Do you need uh, ground control points to, um, to geolocate the images and then do the, the photogrammetry or directly with the positioning of the satellite? you are able to reach those uh, accuracies? <clears throat> so what I uh, I always do only with the satellite information. So we have some files, the RCPs, which we use. But uh, it's uh, we can do that because we always compare two Pleiad DMs with each other. So we will geolocate them relatively one to another and then take the difference. And uh, if you want to compare to other data sources, so like drone or GPS and so on, uh, so either you can just geolocate your DMs <clears throat> with uh, with the one you want to compare with, or you might use GCPs, but uh, 
uh, to be honest, I never did with GCPs, and now I have to start to learn how to do it. But uh, yeah, not necessarily. You can already do a lot of things without uh, any GCPs. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for this super interesting topic, which I think will open new opportunities because it's really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Podéis utilizar también el chat, aquellos que no que os habéis conectado sin sin, sin micro. ¿Eh? I think that some some people is is writing in the chat. So Cesar, if, if you can have a look to the chat, which is yeah. Ah, so one question, is it possible to download these uh, images with Google Earth Engine? Um, so I never used Google Earth Engine, but I don't think so, because it's not uh, it's not at all free open uh, archive. Um, so here, like the Pleiad images, they are somehow handled by Airbus. And so definitely in the hand of a private company and they're really careful with what they do with it. So you have to request specifically some images and say for what you're going to use it and you sign some uh, contracts that you will not share it with anybody and so on. So it's, uh, it's, more, it's more like that than an uh, open, uh, open uh, archive like what you can uh, do with Google Earth Engine, I think. So yeah, no, not with Google Earth Engine. Cesar, you, you know other kinds of applications maybe related to the forestry sector, related to reforestation or deforestation or issues related to erosion? Uh, well, I think that probably the, 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 the error of the, of the images, this 0 0.5, 1 meter, probably has limitations to record some kind of processes that involve small changes like well i think that in, well probably it's very clear for these landslides and rock avalanche that you have so but what is your impression for example for to the assessment of, of erosion the, the, to determine erosion rates or something similar mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a lot of a matter, of course, of the magnitude of your signal, and uh, then the thing, uh, one thing which is a bit counterintuitive is that even if the error at a pixel is quite large, so 70 centimeters, if you average uh, over a quite large spatial area, this error is decreasing. So that what we observed in California, and so then more to uh, something like 30 centimeters if you just take like a 500 meters by 500 meters uh, area square and you take the average uh, snow depth, for example, in there, then the error of this average will be will be lower. And so if you're seeing, you could have a low intensity signal over a large area, and then you could still be able to measure it. So then erosion, erosion um, but I don't know the, the rate, but I guess it's a bit low, but you could imagine if you have, if you, if you live a long enough uh, period between the two acquisition, maybe 10 years or something like that, start to measure things uh, and if it's uh, touching a large enough area uh, maybe river beds i guess this you you could do i can't remember of uh, studies which did it exactly uh, with satellite images but it's done already with lidar so see the snowpack here so the one in california was super thick like uh, up to seven eight meters it was a, a crazy year that year in california so they they call it they called it the snowpocalypse and they had a so that's not a regular snowpack, uh, but here in Bassiès, it's more between uh, zero meters and uh, three, four meters. And you can still 
we're, we are able to map it. So uh, I would say if it's a small signal, but over a very large area, we, we could map it. And then one thing as well is the, do we have a stable terrain around, like a terrain which is not affected by what you want to study. So if everything is changing in your image, you have no chance to, to map it. But if you, ideally you have a large area changing, a large area not changing, and then you can, you can do something. And about forestry, there were some studies. Uh, so that's so there are some studies we, in, in which use satellite this kind of images to map the canopy height. Uh, so and that you can do. And actually, we had some uh, results with that because in winter, so for deciduous forests, which are trees which are losing their their leaves, uh, you will the image will see through uh, the, the 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 forest and kind of see the ground where there is snow, and then in so, so that's in the winter acquisition, and then in summer you see the top of the canopy. And actually, when we take our difference of elevation, we kind of measure the tree height like that because for winter you have the kind of the soil, and in summer you have uh, kind of the top of the canopy. So that's and there are some studies which did uh, related and similar stuff. So that's one application that could uh, that could be, uh, but I don't think it's uh, um, operational uh, yet. But uh, one day it might uh, it might happen. And then deforestation, the, yeah, you'll see it. But I think uh, then you can see it even just with uh, uh, without the elevation information, just the classification of the the images, for instance. Then if you have a, an idea of something to measure, it's always good to try and see. <laughs> you can yeah. have good surprises. OK, thank you. Bueno, pues si no hay más preguntas, vamos a, vamos a cerrar este seminario, eh, dándole las gracias a, a, a... Veo por aquí que hay, hay todavía gente escribiendo. Yeah, I, I'm in the dispatcher with uh, Fergus and uh, Javier, uh, right hand of the building, if you look for me. Uh, I'm happy to discuss more. Muy bien. Pues nada, muchas gracias a todos por vuestra asistencia y, y bueno, pues esperamos a, a, a la próxima charla. Adiós. Okay. Oh.